So yesterday I was having a conversation with some guys who said that the Israel-Palestine conflict stems from a conflict between Jewish people and Muslims. And I had to disagree because while religion is an important factor, in my view the motivating forces for establishing the state of Israel have always been economic. Going all the way back to the Roman Empire, this has always been a very important region to control economically. Even before the importance of oil, there were a lot of raw materials and resources here, and it gave countries access to a whole bunch of trade routes via the Mediterranean. As time passed and oil was discovered in the Middle East, this region became even more important. And that's why in the 1920s, the British moved to colonize it, and this became the British Mandate of Palestine, where British oil companies had essentially free reign. And at this time, as anti-Jewish sentiment was rampaging through Europe, the ideology of Zionism started to emerge. This ideology that says there needs to be established a Jewish state so that Jewish people can protect themselves. And Zionist settlers began moving into the British Palestinian mandate. The British realized they could use this to their advantage and they started funding and supporting the Zionist project, including what's known as the Nakba, where a large amount of Israeli settlers came and pushed 70% of Palestinian people off their land. The British and the Western imperialist powers figured that the Zionists would look out for their economic and political interests a lot more than the indigenous Arab Palestinians. And in the 1960s is when the United States really takes over for Britain as the main funder and supporter of the state of Israel, which proceeded to start a war against the Arabs seizing a bunch more Palestinian land. Now, if anybody thinks that the U.S. is funding Israel because they like Jewish people but don't like Muslim people, you are crazy. Or you just don't know history. The U.S. has literally backed jihadi extremist groups when it's in their economic interest. They've done it a lot, actually. This is them calling Osama bin Laden an anti-Soviet warrior putting his army on the road to peace. This was as the U.S. was funneling him millions and millions of dollars in arms and money. The U.S. doesn't care if you're Jewish, Muslim, Christians, atheists, Hindu, Buddhist. If you protect their economic interests, if you protect U.S. resources and U.S. oil, they will support you or they will give you a bunch of guns to fight the Soviet Union. It's the same thing with Israel. The U.S. props up Israel because it gives them a neo-colonial outpost in the Middle East. Israel's constantly launching missiles at the U.S.'s enemies like Iran and Syria, and they protect the interests of Western multinational corporations. This is why Joe Biden always says if Israel didn't exist, we would have to create it. Because the U.S. needs an entity like this in the Middle East to look out for their economic and political interests. Yeah, it's not necessarily a battle between Muslim people and Jewish people. It's a battle between Western imperialist interests and the interests of native indigenous populations. The interests of Middle Eastern people versus the interests of Western corporations who want to exploit the Middle East for all of its resources, labor, and oil. This video has been brought to you by Karl Marx. Thank you. What if I told you that everything that we see Israel doing today, cutting off water, cutting off electricity, bombing bridges which have humanitarian aid coming into Gaza, what if all those things were documented in a genocidal plan published in 1948 and it's freely available for you to read in full right now after you watch this video? Would you believe that that document exists? Well, I'm going to show you how this 1948 document named Plan Dalit was published in 1948. 39 years before Hamas ever existed in Plan Dalet under the heading of Consolidation of Defense Systems and Fortifications, they very proudly write one of the strategies that they're going to use is destruction of villages, setting fire to, blowing up and planting mines in the debris, especially those population centers which are difficult to control continuously. They also have written just after this point, mounting search and control operations according to the following guidelines encirclement of the village and conducting a search inside it in the event of resistance the armed forces must be destroyed and the population the non-combatants must be expelled outside the borders of the state it goes on under the heading of deployment in major cities they write occupation and control of all isolated arab neighborhoods and it continues especially those neighborhoods which control the city's exit and entry roads these neighborhoods will be controlled according to the guidelines set for searching villages. You know those guidelines which said that they will kill all the armed forces and expel every single person in the village? 
those guidelines. And wait for this one. This is the kicker. This is what we're seeing today. Watch what I'm about to tell you. Encirclement of the central Arab municipal area and its isolation from external transportation routes, as well as the termination of its vital services, water, electricity, fuel, etc., as far as possible. Imagine a terrorist occupying state so arrogant. They think you're so stupid that you can't even Google a written genocidal plan which they're enacting today. And they think that you'll believe every single thing that comes out of their mouth. They can switch from saying it was our airstrike which bombed the hospital, delete the tweet, and then say, actually, no, it was uh, no, from the opposition. They do those things because they think you're so they think that you're lesser than them, and they think that you will never bother to actually Google the facts. This is not a, a source from outside Israel. This is an Israeli source. This is an Israeli official source. Plan Dalit. Go and Google it and share with everyone you know. And then you've got the Israeli army, which I like to refer to as one of the most, one of the best trained, best equipped, best fed terrorist organizations in the world. And yes, they have generals and they have nice uniforms, but their entire, their entire uh, purpose is terrorism. And just as one example, I'll give you one example, almost exactly four years ago, as Israel began its attack on Gaza, September the 27th, 2008, at 11.25 in the morning. What I refer to as the most shameful day in the Jewish history. The most shameful day in the history of the Jewish people. Israel began carpet bombing Gaza, and on the first day of a, what was to be a 21-day attack, they dropped 100 tons of bombs. Okay, a one-ton bomb will decimate an entire city block. Gaza is one of the most densely populated places in the world. 800,000 children live in Gaza. 11.25 is exactly the time when the morning school shift and the afternoon school shift change. So all the kids are in the streets. All the children are on the streets. That was the moment decided by the decision makers in Israel to begin the attack. This is the first day of a 21-day slaughter that had absolutely no justification. If that's not terrorism, I don't know what is. And this is how the state of Israel manages to control the different populations. And somehow still keep up this very sweet liberal kind of face to everything. I want you to remember what's going to happen because it's what they always do. First, they deny the airstrike. Then they will say we did it to ourselves. Then they will quietly admit that they did it to us and that we deserve it. At some point, they will even try to investigate, but never get back to you. And the cycle repeats itself. That's what a Zionist playbook looks like. Let's talk about the previous prime minister of the occupation and his horrible ending. His name is Ariel Sharon. Born in 1928, he's a very well-known war criminal. He took part in several massacres, including the 1953 massacre. He was found personally responsible for the Sabra and Shatila massacres of Palestinian refugees. Please Google it. He was also known as the Butcher of Beirut. He was forced to quit as a defense minister in 1982 and he was elected prime minister in 2001. So in 2006, he had a massive stroke that put him in a coma for eight years. Doctors said that he was in a state of minimal consciousness as he can feel pain and can hear those around him without responding to them. In 2014, his skin started to rot as well as his intestines and his intestines and organs were removed one by one without him being sedated until he died in 2014. 